My name is Jane Maggs. Um, I make specialist preserves and I'm a judge at the Dalmain Marmalade Festival. But to get here has been a very long journey. Um, when I was at school, I was um, very interested in conservation. I did lots of conservation work. But I got to a place at Oxford University to read agriculture and forestry, um, which was a great honour. And so I went there. But at the time, it was the height of the green, green revolution of maximum yields, maximum inputs, maximum pesticides, maximum fertiliser. Um, so although we learnt a lot about soils, about mycorrhizae, about tropical agriculture, we also learned a lot about pesticides and fertilisers. Um, and one of my friends, who is very important in this story, uh, said, this is wrong. And he wouldn't come to any of the lectures. And I continued going to the lectures, and when I graduated, I went to work in the agricultural trade, and I was a grain trader, and I was, um, I told farmers how to grow crops <laughs> with pesticides and fertilisers. Uh, and then one day in 1979, this friend who was working in organic farming and wasn't making any money, and at the time organic farming was very, uh, what should I say, very <sighs> unfashionable, uh, gave me the One Straw Revolution to read. So this was in 40 years ago in 1979. And um, I think I probably understood 25% of it, um, but what he was saying was what I really thought, and I realised that the direction I was going in, in working in agriculture as I was, was not the right direction. So I was very interested in degraded landscapes and, and, and not desertification as much as perhaps mined landscapes that had become ruined and I decided that's where I wanted to go. So I went back to college in Australia uh, doing landscape architecture and I came back to this country after several years working in Australia and I went to work looking at degraded landscapes, um, particularly from chemical works, coal mines where the soils had become enormously degraded but also very acid or very alkaline and it was amazing what nature was doing. Yet we were being asked to dig it all up and make a new landscape and I was saying to people but nature is doing a better job than I can and they didn't like that uh, and I didn't like what I was doing because I felt I was going against nature. So I got very stressed and I left. <laughs> and then uh, nearly 20 years ago, um, I moved to Cumbria. And this is when I started looking at the fruits around me and things that weren't being used, you know, fruits that were growing, plants that were growing that people weren't using, that were being provided. And that's the first time really that I started to make, not a farm, because I don't have a farm, I have a large garden, to make a natural garden um, using Masanobu Fukuoka's principles. So I've been doing that for 18 years now. Um, and it is amazing what nature can do and what nature will do when you leave it alone. And I now give talks, not only do I make preserves, and marmalade, but I also give a lot of talks about how we can use all the plants that are around us because what happens, well certainly in my garden, is that plants that people think they can't eat, uh, they can, they're perfectly edible. So, you know, there are beautiful flowers in the garden that you can eat. Um, I mean, I can show you, I have one picture of my garden that I'd quite like to show you. I don't know whether that would work on camera. Um, so this, this is, yes, I say this has been happening for 18 years now and it was amazing coming here and it's particularly the top where you have the open ground and the vegetables and the trees. That was 
that was just totally, it was so emotional to see that. So, the, so what has happened is that I, f I knew I was going in the wrong direction to start with when I was uh, working in the agricultural industry. And so I moved into landscape architecture and then I realised that what I thought I would be doing there and the fact that I wanted to leave nature alone in a lot of places, people wouldn't let me do that. <laughs> So it's almost that Masanobu's philosophy has made me go in that direction and then kind of go in a <laughs> and go out that way. <laughs> so sort of do 180 degrees because I knew that that was the right thing to do. But I suppose when you're young and you you're um, I don't know, you want to earn money, sorry, you want to earn money, you want a job, you want to do stuff, so you go in a direction that does that, and then you think, you get older, and you think, actually, this is all wrong, <laughs> and that's what Masanobu's philosophy did for me. One of the things I would say that is quite, not very philosophical, well, not very philosophical, is that a weed is the pl a plant in the right place, and people, uh, you know, when Masanobu was looking at in the degraded landscapes, in the desert landscapes, when he was looking at plants where people would say, oh, that's a, an invasive weed, and he, he was saying, no, that plant has huge roots, you know, it's changing the soil, and other things will follow on from it. And, and that's what the, the big weeds do. And I think people problem is people are too tidy. Um, I mean, my garden has been described politely as shabby chic. Um, people, are too, people are too tidy. So people think they don't want to see weeds and they don't want to see tall grass. They want to see nice rows. And I think that thinking, I would say to people, be less tidy. <laughs> and um, be less analytical as well and just watch what nature does because nature always has the best answer. But the other, the other problem with organic, I think, is that the, the, the authorities, the certification authorities and the, the people who um, decide whether you are an organic farm or you know, how you run your organic farm are too, are too rigid and they need to be relax more as well and be less concerned about labels and because I think more people would be involved, more people would start to farm, more people would become organic producers as well because it is quite difficult to be certified. I've actually failed to be <laughs> an organic producer. I've gone through the certification process and failed and it's difficult and it puts people off and it's expensive and I think that that side of it should be less bureaucratic. Yes, I think, I mean, it was very emotional. I mean, it was amazing to go to Masanobu's farm and because I didn't know that he said in his will that it was to be left. And it was, it was really emotional to see that because I sort of studied all the photographs and read what he'd written and all about the, where the apprentices lived and how everything was growing. So that was really emotional. And also when we started at the top of the hill and came down the hill, um, and seeing the daikon, particularly in the, in the, you know, with with the citrus, that was, that's that's it. That's exactly it. Um, and also, it's very interesting what you're doing with the rice and the barley again. Uh, that's that's really good to see. And I think the thing I would say is that I know that this is. You're, you're making a living out of this and that you know, you've changed the philosophy in that way that's gone from self-sufficiency to making a living, which we all want to do. But I would say don't, don't just become an ordinary organic farm. You know, you need to have that. It's easy to sort of forget to talk about the philosophy behind it and I think that's the important thing. Well, obviously, with it being natural farming, to talk about the philosophy behind it and don't lose that because that's that's the thing that 
makes natural farming so different from organic farming, from permaculture, from forest farming, from all those other names that have sprung up. That that's it's the whole looking at the whole. Where even as if because organic farmers can be very analytical and not look at the whole, even though they are organic farmers. And that, to me, is the big difference. And I think going forward for you as a business to not lose that philosophical base 